Steam traps do trap steam. The first day of the vent air. So here's a beautiful old Webster, Warren Webster trap, which shows the workings wonderfully, and that's connected to the radiator. The air gets pushed through there first, and out the bottom, it gets vented somewhere downstream. Over here, you've got this bellows that's filled with a mixture of alcohol and water and, f and sealed under vacuum, designed to scrunch itself up. And when the steam comes along, it's going gonna, it's gonna to heat that alcohol and water mixture and cause it to expand, pushing that pin down into that seat, and the trap is now closed. At this point, you need at least a 10 degree drop in temperature from one side of this trap to the other before it'll open. If it's not doing that, the trap's not working. You want to test a trap and you don't have a lot of money for a trap test station? Make one yourself out of an old pasta pot. Just weld something like this on there. If you're working in the same building over and over again during the summer, take the top of the trap off, put it on your pot, see what comes out of it. If steam spews through there, you know you need to replace those parts. If it doesn't, you know the trap is good, put it back where it was. Floating thermostatic trap is both normally closed on the water side and normally open on the thermostat side. So air comes through here, goes past the thermostat, which is normally open, and vents itself somewhere downstream. Steam comes in and shuts that trap. It's the same type of device that you'll find inside of the thermostatic radiator trap. Once that's closed, the steam's rattling around. It's got nowhere to go. It's never a good idea to insulate F and T traps. You want the steam to condense in there. And when it does condense, it turns to water, and the water begins to build up. And the water uses the buoyancy of that float and a lever to pull that pin away from that seat. Now, we want that pin to pull as far away from that seat as possible so you don't have wire drawing, this metal erosion that takes place when you move across there. So we want to size the trap properly. Now, this is the way it's supposed to work. Steam goes down the end, the F and T trap stops it, rises up here, passes through, stops at the traps, air gets vented out of the main vent over here. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, if I had a if I had a two inch main that ran out 300 feet, the proper size trap for that two inch main would be a three quarter inch trap. That's based on the amount of condensate that's going to form in that main when it goes from ambient temperature to 215 degrees. A three quarter inch trap on a 300 foot long main. Now, if you saw a two inch main, you're going to see a two inch trap on it. That's very common. It's called line sizing of traps. And in the world of heating, I can guarantee you that every single trap that gets sized to the pipe that it's on will be the incorrect trap. And incorrect in, in that you oversized it. You paid too much for it. Not only do you pay too much for it, but it's going to fail because it's oversized. And most of the time, it's just going to be barely lifting the pin away from the seat. That's going to cause metal erosion, and the trap's, the trap's dead. So don't get sucked into that. This is the way traps are supposed to work. They're supposed to trap steam. But let's consider for a minute... If this one trap over here on the first floor, this one guy, his trap fails. Now, when it fails, it, there's no obituary in the newspaper. It doesn't shout. It doesn't grab its chest. It doesn't fall to the ground. It just dies. And often it dies in the open position because that's the position that will cause the most grief. So let's see what happens now. Steam comes up, goes down the end of the main, and starts to climb the ladder. But since that trap's failed, it crosses into the return. And, oh, look, now it's in the return. Now it's in the return downstream of the trap. Oh, it just shut the air vent here. So this, both lines are filled with steam, and everybody above this guy has no heat. Now, this is, a, this is one of those things that's true of life. The guy with the bad trap will always have heat. He will never call you. It's everybody above him. They'll have no heat. So you won't go to this guy. You'll go to these people. And when you go up there, you're going to find, uh, you know, everything seems okay, except that the radiator is not heating. So you're going to be tempted to pop the top of the trap and when you do that, a big rush of air is going to come out, and the radiator is going to get hot. And then you're going to say to yourself, oh, obviously it's not letting the air out. So you're going to do what is in the world of steam heating uh, the stupidest thing possible. You're going to put a one-pipe steam air vent on a two-pipe steam radiator. And I say it's the stupidest thing because the air is going to come out of the radiator, and the radiator is going to get hot. And when, and when the, the trap, which is closed, gets flooded with with the condensate that's trying to get out, it's going to open, and the steam's going to come up the return line backwards looking for that air vent, and it's going to hit the trap backwards and destroy it. So by putting the air vents on your radiators, you're going to wreck all the, wreck, all the radiator traps in the building. And once the radiator traps are, are failed, you've got steam in both the supply and the return, 
Uh, there's no distribution. The boiler's going off on low water. You're spending money on chemicals and on water. There's nobody's got heat, and there's water squirting out of the air vents, and and the boilers the boilers flooding because there's a, an automatic feeder that's replenishing the water that can't get back from the radiators, and all of this is being caused by somebody adding an air vent to a two pipe radiator. So it truly is the stupidest thing because rule number one of all in all of steam heating states that when you do something stupid, you'll always be rewarded in a small way. You wanted that radiator to get hot, you got it hot. But because you were so monumentally stupid, <laughs> the whole system's going to fall apart now. It's just in the cards. So don't get sucked into that. Also note, too, that if you see these, uh, these old-style radiator valves that had little pins on them that you see here, and they had these markings on the top. They were these cast-into-the-top markings. And what, what you need to know is that every one of those markings represents 10 square feet of EDR. Because this radiator valve has an orifice built into it that's variable. So depending on how much you opened it, it would be able to allow in only as much steam as the radiator would condense. And the installer back in the old days would peg the radiator at that point. And because he did this, this radiator is not going to have a trap. So you'll see this type of an inlet valve and you won't see a radiator trap on that, on that radiator. So what you got to be careful about though, is if you replace this old style radiator valve on the supply side, with a modern radiator valve, that's not going to have an orifice in it. And now suddenly you better have a steam trap on there. Otherwise, you're going to send steam full bore through the radiator into the return and mess up the whole building. So one way around having to use a radiator trap would be to open this union connection and install an orifice, which is what the old timers did. Often these were handmade. One of them told me that he used to smoke Prince Albert tobacco because it came in a can and he had a punch. And he would punch out his own orifices and use a 10 penny nail to drive a hole through the middle of it and be able to heat buildings without using uh, steam traps at all. To just do it with orifices on the supply side. 